the second uh, uh, lecture today or the, the second keynote uh, today uh, at the conference and uh, I'm happy to, to introduce Moritz Hess who is a professor. I, I hope that, that I'm up to date with the information because you changed a little bit in the past. <laughs> You're a professor of gerontology at the Hochschule Niederrhein University of Applied Sciences uh, in, in, in Germany. And you're still the director there uh, of the Competence Center Resource Oriented Aging mm -hmm. Research, if that is still correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're in a quite dynamic phase of your life, of course, probably, and so it's better to ask. Uh, you studied uh, sociology and gerontology at uh, in, in several places, and uh, you did research uh, on, on retirement transitions and in, in Bremen. And you also were in, in Dortmund, where you worked with, with Gerd Nagel uh, at the, uh, I think that was a research unit. Mm -hmm. uh, economy and technology, work, work and technology, something like this, work and economy and technology, I think, yeah. uh, at, in Dortmund. And uh, yeah, now, now we are here and I'm happy to have you here because you're an ex excellent expert in, in this field and I'm really happy to have this presentation involved here mm -hmm. in this context under the, under the special focus. And we will hear from you about extended working life, extending working lives in Europe and retirements in Ontario. So a more European, not a global perspective as we started in Berlin, but an extension of the UK perspective to a European focus. And there will be, of course, cross-references cross between the, 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 uh, the different keynotes, which was not uh, unintended. So I'm happy to have this. And yeah, it's up to you. Thanks. OK, uh, thank you, Andreas um, and Elizabeth for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, yeah, as said, I think my presentation links nicely to, to Liam's presentation um, a couple of, of minutes ago. Um, I will take on more the, the European perspective. Um, I will not say global perspective because it is indeed limited to Europe, but um, there were some nice links or there are some nice links to Liam's presentation who gave like this more case study approach on the UK. Um, but uh, there will be some, some overlap and one or two slides will be almost similar, except that I will have um, the European perspective. So I will now try to share my screen and um, this should be working now. And now you should have the slides uh, in, in full perspective. And yeah, today I will talk about expanding working lives in Europe, um, retirements, voluntariness uh, slash involuntariness. So, um, well, I mean, this is, you know, a bit like bringing olds to Athens. Um, societal context of retirement are changing. We have this uh, idea of extending working lives, delaying retirement, active aging, however you want to call it. Um, the, the basic idea is that as uh, societies are aging, we will have less people contributing to pension systems and more people receiving pensions and also receiving them for a longer period of time. And that's why the argument is we have to work longer, we have to delay retirement, and we have to extend working lives. And it seems also that indeed um, retirement behaviors are changing. Um, people across Europe are retiring later, and um, older workers' employment rates are increasing. Of course, with um, large cross-national variation, but there is this general trend towards delaying retirement towards working um, longer. And um, what I will talk about today is have what I call attitudes, attitudes towards retirement change. So um, on the one hand, um, the attitude towards future retirement timing. So basically, when do we want to retire and when do we expect to retire? And I will show that those two are not the same. And the second question then is, how do we perceive retirement as more involuntary, as voluntary, or maybe even as just normal, regular retirement? So these are the leading questions of my talk today. The agenda is I will have, I think, like two or three slides on the policy context. And um, here I'm very thankful to, to Liam Foster, who already explained this in detail for the UK, so I can pick this up quite nicely. Then I will talk about the expected and preferred retirement age. This relates to the first question, when do we want and when do we expect to retire? When we want would be the preferred retirement age. When do we expect to retire is the expected retirement age. And then in the third section of the presentation, I will talk about retirement's voluntariness. And I'm very much looking forward to your questions and comments after the talk. So um, let's go uh, into the policy context. Um, I think this is nothing new to you. Um, we 
I already mentioned uh, demographic aging. So we are going from this age pyramid style with a lot of people um, at, the, at the younger end and a few people at the upper end, this, this pyramid style to one of which I like to call the age döner, where we have fewer younger people, fewer people contributing to pension to old age security systems and more older people receiving pensions and also receiving them for a longer time. And then in almost all countries, and this is not limited to Europe, um, we have debates about, um, yeah, how can we keep up the financial sustainabilities of pension? Um, this young man here is Norbert Blum. He used to be the Minister of Social Affairs and work um, for 16 years um, under Helmut Kohl's um, uh, Chancellor Street, Helmut Kohl was the um, uh, was Chancellor, um, I'm not too sure, up until I think 1998. And um, Norbert Bloom said, you know, if there's one thing that's sure, if that's one thing that's secure, it's our retirement. And a lot of people made quite fun of him for, for this sentence. So um, we have reform pressures um, towards extending working lives, delaying retirement. And, and this is just example for Germany, but this is, uh, yeah. A European at least, and I would even say a global trend, a global development. So we have these developments in China, Korea, and Japan, also in Canada, in the US, and, and Liam just presented it for the UK. So um, yeah, policymakers have been reacting to this um, concerns about the financial sustainability of pension systems. Uh, four points here, and this is really, really a general uh, way of seeing this. Um, First of all, they have been closing early retirement pathways. So in a, quite a few of countries, um, in particular in the conservative centralistic welfare states, um, Bismarckian pension systems, Germany is here the prime example, there has been a closing of early retirement pathways. So um, up until, let's say, mid 1990s, turn of the millennium, um, all the workers could retire way before the statutory official retirement age via, for example, disability pensions, via the unemployment pension. And these early retirement pathways, these early retirement options have been abolished or made financially way less attractive. We have an increase of the official, the state pension, the statutory retirement age, however you want to call it, uh, across many countries, Liam presented it for the UK. In Germany, the increase is actually going on at the moment from 65 to 67 for men and women. And we have some countries where the official retirement age, statutory retirement age is linked to life expectancy. The idea here, if the life expectancy goes up by one year, then the official retirement age automatically will go up by a certain amount of months, six months, eight months. Um, there are different, different ratios here. Um, then we have active labor market measures aimed at increasing older workers, employability and workability. Um, some buzzwords to mention here are lifelong learning. Uh, Germany, for example, we also have subsidies for companies who hire older workers. So um, the idea is to, to increase uh, the employment uh, participation of older workers. Now, number four would be privatization and marketization of old age security. So strengthening second and third pillar old age security. This means strengthening occupational and also uh, private pensions, um, maybe also shifting to um, defined contribution pensions uh, might go in this area. And the idea here is to take financial pressure off the first of the public pension and um, yeah, kind of letting occupational private pensions stepping in to, to fill um, the gap here. Um, uh, fifth point I wanna mention here is that um, at least in certain sectors and uh, in certain countries, um, companies are facing um, a, a lack of, of skilled workers. So in Germany, for example, you could mention here the healthcare sector, the long-term care sector. Um, apparently in Germany, there is a lack of 200,000 people working in the long-term care sector. And um, yeah, companies are seeing all the workers as a kind of source of reliable, of experienced workers and, um, in contrast to, let's say, the 1990 or the 1990s, where all the workers were pushed out by this, um, there is an increasing trend to implement age-friendly HR measures. However, um, 
I would like to emphasize here, this is regarding certain countries, certain sectors, and also certain workers. Um, it is those workers that the companies need. Um, it seems that these measures have, and um, we see an increase of older workers' retirement age, so not the statutory or official retirement age, but the actual retirement age, and also employment rates of older workers are increasing. Um, however, with great national variation, um, if you're interested more in this, uh, Dirk Hofecker and Bernard Ebbinghaus have published in comparative population studies a nice paper uh, in 2013 where they have some nice graphs where you can see the, the national variation in the increase. Um, this increase for the employment rate has been very steep in Germany, in the Netherlands. Um, I just want to make one remark here that I would be very careful to make any causal link between these reforms implemented and the increase of older workers' retirement age and the employment rate. So um, there are other exponential uh, potential explanations. Um, for example, there has been, at least in some countries, a general robust or good um, development on the labor market. So there is this kind of, you know, lack of workforce, the demand for workers is going up. This is like the fifth bullet points on this slide. And um, you could say, well, all the workers are benefiting from, from this general trend. Uh, female labor market participation rates are going up. So today's older female workers are the first who benefited from the educational expansion uh, in the 1960s. Um, these are the baby boomers. We have like a general rising female employment rate. And the third point would be that today's older workers are also better educated, better trained than their predecessors and probably also healthier. So um, takeaway message here, I would be very careful to link these reforms. And I know politicians like to do this link um, because you know, they want to pat themselves on the shoulder that this has been successful, but um, I would be careful to, to make this link. Okay, so much for the policy context and um, now I will go on to future um, retirement timing. I will talk about two concepts. Um, we have first the preferred retirement age. Um, that is the age at which an individual would like to retire without considering contextual determinants. So basically, if I would ask you now, when do you want to retire now and forget about you know, any obligations you have to the family, forget about the pension height, uh, the pension, you know, the, the level of pension, just when do you want to retire right now? And then we have the expected retirement age, which is a realistic evaluation. So basically taking into account institutional workplace and also individual contexts and potential pension deductions accompanying early retirement. And, and you could say that the expected retirement age equals the preferred retirement age, taking into account incentives and constraints. And in the next couple of slides, I will show some uh, studies which have looked at the preferred retirement age and the expected retirement age and um, how these have developed within the last years. And in the third study, I will show also like a kind of, you know, um, attempt to just oppose um, preferred and expected retirement age. So um, the preferred retirement age, this is a study um, with uh, European countries comparing 2003 and 2011, taking data from the Eurobarometer and European Social Survey. And here you see that there's an increase of the preferred retirement age between 2003 and 2007 on average by 1.5 years. Um, what is interesting about this increase is um, when using regression technique, you can find that it is significantly stronger for those with high education. So it seems that those with high education, well, for them, um, it's easier or they are more able to adapt to this trend regarding the preferred retirement age. So preferred retirement age is increasing more strongly for those with high education. Expected retirement age, this is now data for Germany, a German aging study and the social economic panel. And um, here you also see an increase. So people expect to retire later. However, here you see um, a bit of a different development. The increase is stronger for those with low education. So this is the international classification of education scale. Zero to two is low education, medium education, high education. And here you see that we have a trend from a more linear correlation between education, which we use or which I use as a proxy here for social status, to a more U-shaped. So it seems that the um, expected retirement age is, is increasing 
more steeply for uh, those with low education. And sorry for that. Um, if you um, kind of contrast expected and preferred retirement age, you find that, and this is again German data, about uh, two thirds of the population um, want to retire earlier than they expect to be allowed to retire. Um, for about a, a bit lower than a third uh, preferred and expected retirement age, they, they are the same. And about 6% say, I want to retire later than I uh, expect to retire. And what is um, that um, those with medium and those with high education, they believe that they will be more able to synchronize preferred and expected retirement age, or they even say, uh, I want to work uh, longer than I expect to. Uh, here, normally I make the fun, these are the few German professors who never want to stop working and are forced by the German uh, state law to, to quit after 67. And um, here you can see the results. So basically, it seems that um, those with low education uh, think that they have to work longer than they actually would like to do. And those with medium and high education, well, they believe they can retire then when they want to. So um, takeaway message would be um, both expected and preferred retirement age are increasing. However, the expected is increasing faster for those with low education and the preferred retirement age is increasing faster for those with high education. The high educated, they expect and prefer to retire late and the low educated expect to retire late but would like to retire early. And um, we had this discussion after Liam's um, presentation. This, of course, you could, and I actually do this also in my in my pres in my publications, interpret as an yeah new form of social inequality with regards to um, retirement. So so much uh, on future retirement timing. Um, the last section now, and this is going to be the longest, is on the voluntariness of retirement transitions. And here I have a nice quote from Hannah von Soligen and Kenny Hankins, where they say, well, retirement is one of the main, main life course transitions uh, in a late adult life and um, how retirees experience this transition as voluntary versus involuntary has very strong implications um, for their well-being. So um, this is kind of, you know, uh, um, my take away that uh, how you perceive your retirement as voluntary, involuntary, is, is quite important for your well-being. So um, this is a study um, which is, or a project which is currently ongoing. It's funded by the German Pension Insurance. And um, we basically have two work packages. I'm gonna present uh, results from both. This is preliminary stuff, so work in progress. Um, nevertheless, I'm happy to share uh, working papers. Um, the first work package, what we did is a systematic literature review. So we really tried to, um, Get, a, get an overview about what has been done on uh, potential determinants of voluntariness of retirement. And the second work package is then kind of building onto the systematic literature review. And here we use SHARE data, SHARE Survey of Health, Aging, Retirement, which is a panel study going on in Europe. Um, unfortunately, not in the UK. In the UK, you have um, ELSA, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, um, and, and SHARE is, is a, a survey every two years, the same people, um, I think older than 45 are interviewed. And um, using this secondary data, we analyze um, how reasons for involuntary retirement have changed between two retirement uh, cohorts. So I will first start with presenting results from the systematic literature review. Um, what we basically did, we um, you know um, hacked in these two types of keywords. So keyword one is the more retirement side and keyword two is the voluntariness into several data, uh, databases and then took all the hits we found and um, looked first at abstracts and titles. Um, and uh, after um, then uh, kind of choosing those which we found according to a certain predefined, um, yeah, uh, Rasta, uh, in, in, important for our study, we then uh, screened 57 full texts, and in the end, uh, we had nine studies which fulfilled um, our requirements for being included into um, our systematic um, literature review. 
So, um, um, determinants, or you could probably more correctly say variables that correlate with retirement's voluntariness. And I will talk about how we operationalize um, retirement's voluntariness in a minute. Um, could be found on the meso, macro, and uh, micro level. Um, voluntariness of retirement was operationalized um, in uh, three ways or three free patterns. First, people were uh, asked, yeah, have you retired voluntarily or involuntarily? The second one was comparing um, the actual retirement age versus the preferred retirement age. And then um, we have this categorization of reasons of retirement into voluntary or involuntary. Uh, I will show um, one way to do this in a couple of minutes um, for the share data analysis. So on the macro, so on the country level, we found that the overall um, yeah, um, uh, economic um, uh, state of the country was uh, positively correlated with voluntariness of retirement. This means the higher the GDP, the more voluntary uh, retirements we had. Uh, a higher unemployment rate uh, meant a more involuntary retirement. Uh, the Employment Protection Index or Employment Protection Legislation, um, here the argument is that they kind of decrease flexibility and hence it was correlated with um, more involuntary retirement. Life expectancy um, as a proxy for um, the population's health um, was correlated with more voluntary retirement transitions. Um, on the company or the meso level, we found that those variables that increase older workers' agency over the retirement, they are related or correlate with uh, voluntary retirement, uh, with retirement transitions. So basically, um, if you have access to an occupational pension, which gives you a bit more uh, financial flexibility, um, then the probability to have a voluntary retirement transition increases. The same we found for company size and um, job tenure. Here, the argument is um, in larger companies, there's more flexibility to change a job if you're not happy or cannot do your old job anymore. And um, larger companies are still offering more early retirement options. And those who have been working or have a longer tenure most or often have uh, higher wages and um, better working conditions, hence increasing their, um, yeah agency of retirement and meaning more voluntary retirement. Uh, results for the sector are ambivalent. Um, we found that people working in the um, uh, agricultural sector have more voluntary retirement, you can argue about this. And those people working for the state, so public employees, they also have a higher share of um, voluntary retirement. Uh, quite a lot of variables on the micro level that we found in the literature. I will not go into detail with all of them. Um, I will try to kind of cluster them. So basically, and uh, let's say the usual suspects for uh, disadvantaged uh, social life causes, they also increase the probability for involuntary retirement. So people with low education, those with low income, those with um, uh, experience of unemployment and also those with migration background, they had a higher share of or a higher risk of involuntary retirement. Um, the same is true for those with poor health. Um, those retiring later, um, they had a higher chance of voluntary retirement. And um, so those who um, were still in, a, still but were in a relationship or had kids, they um, said that their probability of retiring uh, voluntarily was um, higher. For gender, we find that men have a higher risk of involuntary retirement. This is still a bit of a puzzle for me, um, kind of you know, a pre glimpse to the data analysis we've shared. We find the same results also in our study. So um, this is still up for um, debate. So, so much on this. If you're interested, I can forward um, the, the paper. We do discuss all the words there in detail. So um, now, Let's go over to um, the data analysis we did. And here I would like to emphasize again, this is real work in progress. So please do not expect any you know, final results. And I'm very much looking forward to your comments. And we use shared data, uh, wave one to wave six, excluding wave three, because we do not have the necessary information. 10 countries. And um, 
we uh, kind of include those people into our um, sample who retired between 1996 and 2015 at the age 55 to 17. And we have two retirement cohorts between 1996 and 2005 and 2006 and 2015. And as you can see, the sample sizes are kind of um, balanced. Um, we were very happy um, about this. So how did we operationalize voluntariness of retirement? Involuntary retirement is if you say I did retire because I was made redundant, own, in or own ill health or ill health of a relative or friend. Then we have voluntary retirement. I was offered an early retirement option to retire at the same time with my spouse, to spend more time with the family, to enjoy life. And then we have something which we call neutral or regular retirement. And this basically means I became eligible either for public, occupational, or private pension. So this will be the dependent variable in our um, yeah, analysis, which I will show in a minute. And um, yeah, keep this in mind. This is how we do it. And we can debate if all these reasons are really fitting into voluntary, involuntary, or neutral retirement. So um, descriptive results, and, and please do not have a look at all the countries uh, uh, singly, just the last row down here. Um, the total, we see that um, the share of those who say I retired due to involuntary reasons is decreasing, and the share of those who say due to neutral reasons, so reaching the eligibility age of private occupational or public pensions is increasing, um, basically no effect for voluntary retirement from uh, 21.58 to 21.22%. What we did now, we um, used multinomial logistic regressions and um, this is uh, uh, the dependent variable as I said, uh, the, the voluntariness of retirement. So reference category is here, involuntary retirement. And not too surprising, we see that those with high education, they have a higher chance, a higher probability for normal and voluntary retirement, those retiring later as well. This fits quite well with um, what we found in, in the literature. And the same is also true for, for those um, with longer tenure. Uh, public servants um, have a higher probability for normal retirement. And um, yeah, women have a higher chance of normal retirement compared to men. Also those um, retiring in the second cohort, so between 2006 and uh, 2015, there is a higher probability for normal and also voluntary retirement. This kind of reflects um, the descriptive results. We also did some interaction effects between a cohort and gender and cohort and education. And you see that this effect is significant, but as it is, at least in my opinion, impossible to interpret, um, coefficients in logistic regressions, interaction coefficients in logistic regressions, we did some predictive probabilities um, for the interaction effects. And um, what you can see here is um, that the increase in normal retirement age, or to be precise, those who perceive um, their retirement as normal on this voluntariness scale, um, is mainly driven by those with low education. So um, this is cohort one, this is cohort two. And here you see it was 60% uh, of those with low education here, it's 66%, while there has been almost no change for those with high education. And there is an increase in voluntary retirement for those um, with um, high education. So there seems to be a shift towards normal and voluntary retirement away from involuntary retirement, however, the shift towards normal retirement is mainly driven by those with low education, education uh, being here, um, tertiary education, then you are higher education. And the shift towards voluntary retirement is mainly driven by those um, with high education. So um, now I present some, this is some really preliminary stuff. It's really hard to read, but um, as said, this is work in progress. We also tried to, to uh, integrate uh, country level variables into our um, models. This was really hard. We tried to do it with a meta-analysis. We also used a Bayesian approach. Um, at the end, structural equation models seem to be the, the best fit. And um, what we do here, um, we correlate um, these four variables at, um, at the country level with um, uh, the outcomes, uh, involuntary, normal, and voluntary retirement. 
And um, as you can see, a higher GDP is correlated with an increase of voluntary retirement and a decrease of normal retirement. Um, this effect is also significant. Um, there's also an interesting um, and I would say counterintuitive or surprising effect of a higher unemployment rate, rate, which goes in the direction that there's less normal retirement in countries with a higher unemployment rate, but a bit more voluntary retirement. And we see basically no effects for life expectancy and employment protection legislation. And when we look at cohort number two, um, we see that basically we see nothing. So no significant correlations whatsoever between these four variables on the macro level and countries' um, share of um, voluntariness. So one could argue that um, the importance of country level variables has decreased uh, between the cohorts. This is very preliminary. We're still um, working on, on this. So um, summary for um, retirement's voluntariness, less involuntary retirement. Um, we have more normal and voluntary retirement. The increase of voluntary retirement is stronger among the high educated and the increase of normal retirement um, is stronger among the low educated. And the role of institutional variables or country level variables seems to decrease. So um, to uh, sum up, um, expected and preferred retirement ages are increasing um, as well as the share of normal retirement, regular retirement. However, um, we should pay attention to, and here I was kind of you know, a bit daring, a bit bold, at first, I thought like we should pay attention to, to group differences, but um, I would say we should pay attention to inequalities. Um, as also mentioned by Liam and, and later on discussed, um, we might have an increase in inequalities in retirement between men and women, maybe also between those from a more uh, yeah, higher uh, socioeconomic status group. Um, we most definitely have to look at groups um, with, with poor health, uh, migrant groups, so this would be my, my takeaway home message. Um, there seems to be this um, adaptation towards um, extending working life policies, but we um, have to be very careful that um, we do not leave certain groups um, behind and that everybody has, has a fair chance for, um, yeah, retiring um, in dignity as Gerd Nigele um, would, would say. So um, thank you very much. Um, I think I was halfway on time and I'm very much looking forward now to your questions. Thank you. Um, if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat and we can call on you to ask your question. Oh, it looks like we have a question from Andreas. Um, Andres, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, may, maybe I've missed. It. Maybe I didn't. didn't uh, I do not remember the the, uh, the information. But what what is what is retirement in, in your in your definition? We had the discussion before. Uh, the retirement is of course uh, the, the 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 pension income received. So the entry into pension income received is really the exit from the labor market. Mm -hmm. And quite often, it's also that retirement is just not a time or not not a single event, but a period and, and a mm -hmm. transition phase. So, what, what exactly is this? And, and then it's, it's also the question: what how how does maybe retirement as a phase that includes a reduction of 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 of, uh, of, of uh, work intensity, maybe the exit from work and, and the, the receipt of a transfer income? Does this mm -hmm. also have something to do with the, with the issue of voluntary? I'm going to take the easy way out and say, for me, retirement is whatever my respondents in share, Diaz and Zup and Eurobarometer think it is. So that, was, um, that answer was uh, the one that I was afraid of. <laughs> yeah. So, you, you, but you I would ask exactly Yeah, is, uh, I, I don't know. So yeah. um, they could say retirement for me is when I leave the labor market. But if, example, I'm using this early retirement pathway in Germany of Altersteilzeit, um, where basically uh, you, you do not work anymore, but are still paid for by the employer for two and a half years. Well, is this retirement or is retirement the first Monday I receive um, money coming from the pension insurance? And uh, I could be now cynical and say, of course, this question regarding retirement as, as, a, as a, you know, 
period of maybe two or three years is coming from Sweden with your, you know, flexible retirement age. So this is really, really a problem in particular with regards to cross country comparison. So what is retirement? Um, and the only answer I can give is whatever the respondents in the survey do think retirement is. Um, in share the question for the um, uh, for the voluntariness or the reasons on which base we operationalize then retire uh, voluntariness is um, for what reason did you retire? But of course, one one answer is I was made redundant. Mm. So this this most definitely is a problem, and I think something we should um, go more into detail. Mm. Thank you. Just more questions. Um, it looks like the next question is from George. George, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, and <laughs> um, sorry for the delay. So I actually have two questions, but I, I will proceed just with the one. Uh, I, I may have missed it, but um, I was wondering why the analysis was disaggregated by cohorts, like cohorts one and cohorts two. Easy answer, because we so far had not enough computational power to run it with the two analysis integrated. So this whole um, multinomial regressions with like um, with with uh, this um, three category outcome. And then using structural equation models, we so far were not able to, to have models that really converge um, um, satisfactory for us. So that's why we ran the country level stuff uh, separated by cohorts. Um, the analysis without the country um, variables was run as, as one model. That, that is the answer to it. And um, we are still working on this. So if you have any ideas, um, please do send me an email um, we are desperately looking for, for possibilities to, to also integrate the country level variables into a model that um, is not separated by cohorts. Thank you. And um, it looks like Mary Beth has the next question. I believe it's a comment, but I don't know, Mary Beth, if you want to unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Hi. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, my, uh, I'm a queen city in um, uh, Kingston, uh, Canada, um, and I'm doing work on uh, involuntary retirement. And uh, in particular, I just finished a systematic review of uh, predictors of involuntary retirement. So um, I'm in a bit of a shock <laughs> right now that uh, that our, our work is overlapping quite a bit. Um, so, but I'm interested in, uh, in you know, whether you've published yet or not, and uh, two, um, what the implications uh, you have found through that systematic review in terms of, you know, how are we um, uh, policy implications for organizations or an, even at the uh, national policy level? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mary Beth, thank you for the comment. Um, just send me an email. Maybe we can exchange um, results. Um, we have not yet published our um, our systematic review. We are currently in a revise and resubmit stage. Um, regarding recommendations, so um, we have several recommendations. The first one is that most of the studies are from, um, I'm going to use this word, although I don't like it, modern Western societies. So we have almost no studies from, um, yeah, also rapidly aging countries like uh, China, Japan, uh, Korea. So this Eurocentrism would be the first um, recommendation we take away. We have quite little information on the country and the company level, quite a lot of information on the individual level. So this would be um, the next recommendation um, we, uh, we would make. Um, also, how these um, have changed, how has the, uh, the voluntariness of retirement um, changed um, within the last years? Um, the second study I presented today is, is one first um, idea going uh, into this direction. Um, and um, then uh, one recommendation would be, well, if you want more voluntary retirement, you should like improve working conditions um, of workers and in particular of those um, with low socioeconomic status. 
Um, I have a quick follow up question. I, uh, I'm I'm uh, separating my I'm I'm going to be working on um, a data from the longitudinal study in aging in Canada, yeah. and um, I'm separating all of my analysis um, by uh, by sex um, because and I wondered why um, maybe it was a data issue for you, but. Um, uh, I'm wondering well, and I, I'm also focusing on the most recent uh, retirees, and haven't done this, you know, kind of uh, cohort uh, analysis that you've done. Um, so I'm interested in in why um, you didn't consider, I guess, separating by sex. Um, or why you did, maybe you considered it but didn't do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so first of all, we wanted to see if um, gender or sex does have. Um, uh, could be considered as a determinant. And as we see, women seem to perceive retirement more often as normal than uh, men. Um, so that was a reason. Um, but I agree, we should probably separate it. Um, we haven't done it so far. I don't know if we have enough cases. That might be an issue because, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know. It would be 1,500. Yeah, we might do that. I'll, I'll just take that as a comment. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we did in the in the systematic review. We did find a few um, studies that did separate by sex and had and, and there were differences um, yeah. in, in predictors. Yeah, great, yeah. thank you. Most definitely. So we have a lot of. I mean, um, there are differences um, for women and for men regarding uh, certain determinants on voluntariness of retirement. I would absolutely agree. With that. Thank you. It looks like the next question is from Sarah. Sarah, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is in relation to the interaction effect that you mentioned with respect to the education variable. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if actually the, um, maybe the pathway or on the pathway uh, of that kind of interaction, you have the employment type variable. And if that was basically maybe causing uh, that mm -hmm. kind of effect. So mm -hmm. the question mm -hmm. is, did, were you able to test uh, for employment type interaction in the model? Could you uh, specify what you mean by employment type, self-employed, and, and the, or what do you mean by employment type? Yes, yeah, so if there was any data collected on what sort of employment the participants were engaged in prior to the retirement, so was it uh, professional or non-professional, high-skilled or low-skilled, that followed from uh, the level of okay. education. Yeah. And if that variable was, was actually measured in, in the data, were you able to, to test the interaction yeah. effect of that measure? Yeah, okay. So um, we do uh, distinguish by um, public servant, self-employed and, and, and others. Um, we do not distinguish by, let's say, white collar, uh, occupational or, or manual work. And of course, education is here proxy for several other variables. Um, so what you would recommend to include um, uh, characteristics of the previous job? Yes, I think it's just a matter of looking at uh, this additional dimension that yeah. employment and work experience brings that is somehow hindered if we just look at education, uh, yeah. because sometimes people might have um, less years of education, but more years of work experience, and that would affect their work trajectories. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if that variable mm -hmm. might bring more insights um, and, and maybe better interpretations mm -hmm. to the changes mm -hmm. you are observing in the model. So probably uh, either yeah. add it or replace it uh, and yeah. see what effect it can have. Yeah, thank you very much. We will, we will try to do that. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question? You can raise your hand or type it in the chat um, and I can call on you to ask your question. Um, okay. Oh, Margaret, it looks like you have a question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure, thank you. Uh, this is sort of broadening the discussion of, of what is retirement. Um, and a, a corollary question um, could be, what is work? Uh, I'm understanding generally from the context and the discussion that you mean paid work, but um, volunteer work, um, care work uh, can also be work. Um, and I'm, I'm presenting myself as an example of, of someone who dealt with retirement in a different way. 
I did my doctorate in late middle age, and I was looking forward to being able to, quote, retire. In other words, get what I call an old age operating grant uh, fairly soon after I graduated. So I'm in that situation now. I'm 68. I took my first government pension when I was 67. And um, now I am supported by that income so I can do what I want in terms of academic work without having to work for anyone else. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm still working. Mm -hmm. I have not retired. I'm doing it for love, not money. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I have uh, struggles sometimes explaining this to people because people assume the traditional hetero patriarchal, um, mm -hmm. as Liam used the term, trajectory of work where retirement you work full time until you get to a certain age and then you retire and you stop working. Well, of course, we know from your presentation and Liam's that that is not the case these days, that people are mm -hmm. continuing to work depending on the mm -hmm. mandatory retirement age, their, their availability of pensions and so on. Um, past the age of what would be normally 65 in Canada. Um, and I'm wondering if we can broaden our thinking beyond sort of like, um, what is retirement to what is work and how do people like me fit into the statistics? Like if mm -hmm. I responded to a survey, I don't know if I'd be able to, if my situation would be included in the data mm -hmm. of, of, I consider myself working. I work several days a week, but mm -hmm. I don't get paid for it generally. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I do, but generally I don't. Mm -hmm. But I'm to me and to, as I explained to other people, I'm still working <laughs> and I will do this as long as I'm uh, physically and mentally capable. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I absolutely agree. I think like um, we have to distinguish in more detail what we mean by by uh, working. Just last week, I was at a conference called Caring Societies, and there the um, the organizers really emphasized: please say it's paid work. And um, I absolutely agree. So, and I think it's not only work, I think this whole idea of having this, you know, tripartition of the life course, you know, until 20 something, you have to be finished with education, then you work until 60 something, and then you're retired. Um, yeah, in my capacity as, as a professor at, at the University of Applied Science, I also am head of the, um, yeah, we call it the guest student program. And we have a lot of people who are older than 70 and they participate and they really actively participate in university lectures. And of course, you could also say they're not retired, they are participating, it, it might not be paid. So um, I absolutely agree, we have to um, broaden our perspective there. And we have to take uh, certain sex or gender issues into account. Um, we do not know how many women because of, you know, societal obligations retire from paid work to do unpaid care work. Um, there is this trend, Leah mentioned this, this care credits, I think in Germany, you can also like a certain time of caring also um, contributes to your pension. But still there is this, um, let's say, um, notion that work or good work um, is only the work that we get paid for. And um, yeah, I, um, the only thing I can say, um, we have to work with the data that's available. And um, I think the, the share of people who is still working in whatsoever way after being retired is increasing. And, and this is gonna be super interesting in the future. So that's all I can say to this. And um, I think we should really, really take this into account. Great, thank you. I might just make, make a comment as, as, as university professors, you can probably influence or you may be able to influence what data are collected. Um, that happens a lot in Canada. Um, Statistics Canada consults with academics and, and uh, civil society groups about what they should collect data on. So this is an opportunity to say, what about collecting data on this? And this is the yep. rationale. So you have it already. Yeah, there. I absolutely agree. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. It looks like we have time for a couple more questions. Um, next, it looks like George has his hand up. So George, if you want to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, maybe we have time to proceed with my second question as in the chat. And I wonder, um, um, did this leveling of the effect of GDP and unemployment uh, rates on uh, mm -hmm. voluntary retirement between the cohorts, 
Mm -hmm. Do you think that maybe it's the result of the financial crisis uh, that hit the Europe? You know, because the the waves of of share was from 2002 and onwards. That that is that they captured differences actually mm -hmm. that could be um, attributable to to the financial crisis because the financial crisis influenced both GDP and and unemployment rates, although differently. In, mm -hmm. in in many countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, I just have to figure out how to include the financial crisis into the models, but I absolutely agree. This might be... Um, this, I, I don't know, I don't know if it's necessary to go in the models, but maybe in the interpretation level. Of course, uh, no. Uh, for sure. So, so in the discussion, we will mention um, we will mention this. But it would be, of course, more elegant to include it in the models. I'm not too sure how to do this, to be honest. But um, no, of course, in the interpretation, we will mention. I think we are already mentioning um, um, the financial crisis. Yeah, might be interesting to see, like how hard the financial crisis has hit certain countries, or may, maybe maybe certain countries stronger than others. I'm just thinking about you know comparing Greece and Germany, but okay, thank you. I'm, yeah, this, this is a very good idea. Thank you. Um, it looks like the next one in the chat is from Christine. Uh, Christine, did you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, yes, um, just wanting to see, uh, it's more of a comment that since the pandemic hit, um, many nurses that were close to retirement decided to extend their stay. Um, and now with the second wave, we're seeing the opposite. Um, we're getting a lot of fatigue for nurses. So there are a lot more nurses that are retiring earlier the second round. So mm -hmm. I don't know how much of the pandemic will be played into the data you, you collect in the future. Yeah. Uh, so what, what country are you from? United States, California okay. specifically. Yeah, okay. That is interesting. In Germany, we had kind of similar discussions like uh, bringing back um, already retired nurses to kind of uh, mitigate this, this um, lack of skilled nurses. I do not know if we yet have an effect like nurses retiring earlier due to the corona um, crisis. Okay, this is, this is interesting, but uh, in the data I presented today, the, the corona crisis is not yet included. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it looks like our final question comes from uh, Lisbeth. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I don't know if Liz Lisbeth, uh, can you hear me? If not, I can always read her comment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think she might be having technical difficulties. So I'll read. I think it's a comment she wrote in Sweden, a scholar at a public university cannot automatically continue working after the mandatory retirement age of 68, only the at the decision of the university in question. So I think it was more of a comment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in Germany, it's the same 67. Um, I will I will end on a bit of a cynical note here. Um, you know, I'm 30 something, so I think it's good that professors in Germany have to retire with 67 to make space and room for younger. If yeah, I might think differently when I'm 60 something. So thank you. Um, so that was um, about the amount of time we have for questions. Um, I posted the discussion board in the chat. Um, so I encourage everyone to continue the discussion there, comment, and then we also have a plenary session tomorrow morning for um, Catherine Comp. I'm going to post the link for that in the chat as well. Um, and I hope to see everyone online and at the sessions tomorrow. And uh, thank you, Mertz, for this amazing, amazing presentation. And thank you for participating. And thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yep. Bye, everyone.